Nick Macherison here, and welcome to Top Med Talk. Today's Top Med Talk discusses the measurement of exercise tolerance before surgery study, the MET study. Here, Monty Mython and Desiree Chapel call Professor Mike Grocott of Southampton University and one of the lead investigators and an author of the paper to discuss what it means and where we go from here. Have a listen. Top Med Talk. So, Mike, tell us what, what I don't know how, what to make of the result of the MET study. I've read that paper now two or three times. I've heard it presented and the paper says one thing and the presenters seem to say a different thing. Get, let's have your perspective on it. So I think it's a really interesting but unfortunately rather complicated study, not least because it's essentially comparing four means of evaluation with four separate outcomes. But if we start, I guess, with the primary outcome, which we can discuss in itself, which is myocardial infarction and death at 30 days, it appears that is associated with the functional risk measure DARSI and not with anything else. But there's a caveat to that, which is that if you look at this notion of net reclassification index, which is the idea, the statistics essentially say, so if I add this new measure into my established model, will it make any difference? Will I attribute risk to different patients? The the answer appears to be no in relation to DARSI and that primary outcome. Okay, I'm I'm a little bit lost already. That sounds very clever to me. So DARSI is the Duke, as we've been over, the Duke Activity Status Index. So this is the score that goes from are you bed bound through to I'm playing at Wimbledon. Uh, Yeah. And that score has a, in simple terms, the headline, it has a relationship, it is predictive of the primary outcome variable, i.e. the lower the score, the more likely for the primary outcome variable which is, say again... 30-day death or myocardial infarction. Okay, that. And, and that overall, that's very important, but it was rare. Well, it, it was both rare, so, and, and the DARSI was associated with it, but it didn't appear to offer any, any additional predictive benefit. Okay, so that's the is, second... Which sounds complex. You, yeah. Go, go for that again. So, so, then when you, so you do the headline result, very rare outcome variable, but important one. The score relates to it, and that score, as we said, has been in the guidelines for at least 20 years, as far as I can remember, as being related to cardiac outcomes. So the cardiac outcome, which is rare, it is predictive of it. But then you do this other statistical analysis, and it doesn't add anything. Try and help us understand that. So the notion of the net reclassification index is, if you add in this new information, so in this case the DARSI score, does it alter how you classify risk for individuals in a particular group? And the basic answer here is that it does not so what's the take home for that what 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 did i'm going to bring in desiree desiree what are you going to do with that next week <laughs> that's what i was going to ask you mike um tell me practically what uh what i'm going to do because i i don't get much from what you've talked about already. So, so i'm not sure you're going to do a lot okay. and although we <laughs> we as a group of authors concluded in the paper that uh darcy may have additional benefit for uh-huh. predicting these cardiac outcomes uh, I think the may is very much the operative word there. Yeah. It, 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 this is not a convincing uh, slam dunk. So maybe we still do DASI if if we're doing it already. But yeah. what what we can conclude from that is so I might help. to take you back then to the bit that you don't really get from the abstract. But I've had from every presentation and discussion I've had so far, it, it seems as though most of the complications are those that are commonly reported. Things like pneumonias and infections. Uh, readmissions etc and the cardiopulmonary exercise testing variables did predict those major complications or associated with it both the cardiopulmonary exercise testing variables were both associated with uh, and predicted and and actually to be more precise the vo2 peak the anaerobic threshold was not the vo2 peak was okay so the vo2 peak predicted so that sounds to me and i know we're prejudiced here we're biased but that sounds to me as it reinforces the fact that that is a useful test to predict the complications that are the real significant burden. That would be my perspective on this. Part of this depends on your sort of philosophical bias as to whether overall complications are important or whether the heart is at the centre of everything. OK, well, I'm in the camp whereby I don't want to have a troponitis and I don't want to die, but they're pretty rare. What happens much more commonly because it makes up 95 percent of the reported complications are the other things Mm -hmm. so personally on behalf of the patients on behalf of the population i'm interested in both but i'm actually a little bit more interested in the cpet result and when you do this clever extra test this twist to see if it adds anything 
what happens then? So the answer is yes, in relation to the CPET derived VO2 peak uh, in the prediction of general complications. So it's both associated with and it adds extra value in terms of predicting. Okay. So why can't you get any of that from the abstract? It's partly a product of the peer review process. It's partly a product of the fact that it's difficult to squeeze. It's such a big, complex study. It's difficult to squeeze all those answers into the uh, into an abstract. Um, there were some comments about CPET in the abstract way back when, but they've got lost on the peer review journey. Because it wasn't the stated primary outcome variable? Is that the key bit there? Well, for reasons we can go into if we want to, the primary outcome was a cardiac-focused outcome, okay. and therefore the abstract uh, focused on that. Gotcha. So, remind me what the complication rate was again, overall, the major complications? So, just under 14%. There were 194 major complications out of 1,400 more patients, uh, which, interestingly, e even if you look at the myocardial injury data, that, that their major complications uh, uh, outweigh the MINs, the myocardial injury data. There's right. only about 13% of those. Okay. Have you talked to anyone yet who disagrees with that evaluation of it? No. Okay, so we've got consistency here. Whew. Desiree, but I, haven't, but I, haven't, I haven't been to North America and talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably why we've ended up on the men's part more than the, uh, yeah. than the CPET part or the uh, other um, outcomes. I, it seems more clear to me after this discussion, you know, what we're, what we're talking about, the differentiation between the two um, and the value of both of those things. So. We're, we're clear. Great stuff. So, Mike, can I switch gear for a second? We're, we're doing a piece today about reflections on EPOM 2018. Um, so, first of all, um, from your perspective, good meeting, okay meeting? Another uh, bias, loaded question. Really, uh, yeah, loaded question. I'm clearly biased because I'm involved. But I, I, in comparison with EPOM, which is usually a really good meeting, I thought it was a really excellent meeting this year. And, and a lot of the discussions were about this difference between QA and QI, quality assurance and quality improvement. And we had the results of the EPOC trial, E-P-O-C-H trial, this large step wedge cluster randomized trial presented by Carol Peden and Rupert Pierce. And that's going out today on Top Med Talk, both the full lecture mm -hmm. and the roundtable discussion Sat led by Desiree. Rupert, yeah. Now, when Rupert presented the results, because this is a massive trial, there was an audible gasp <laughs> in the room. What did you, because absolutely no difference at all. Uh, uh, you know, were you surprised at that, Mike? Um, so I, I wasn't surprised in that it appeared, you know, in his warm up to that, it did appear that the process measures hadn't been shifted much. And if you're not shifting the process measures, it seems less likely uh, you're going to shift the outcome measure. It should make us think a little bit more about quality improvement. It's not as easy or as straightforward as we think. Right. The contrast with the uh, emergency laparotomy collaborative results is intriguing. Yes, and we'll yeah. be, we're going to go into that in some yeah. detail later on because, as you say, when we look at the EPOC trial, with the level of resource they were allowed to apply, the process measures, pick any one of the big six, didn't shift much, whether that be the antibiotics or the time of the scan or the goal-directed therapy. There was, a, there was no real difference in the use and adoption of those things as a result of the relatively, let's call it relatively under-resourced yeah. quality improvement endeavours. But is that right? C correct, yeah. But the big difference with the other one we heard about was they invested more resource and energy and formed teams and looped people back and changed the process measures and changed the outcomes. That, to me, seemed to be the big learning point. If you're going to characterise epoch was a little bit like you know you, you drop in the rock star for a couple of weeks to tell you what to do, but then actually they move on somewhere else and the follow through may be quite limited. Uh, whereas the emergency laparotomy collaborative seem much more about building a community around an approach to quality improvement and having a sustained approach over time. So we'll have experienced this a lot in the NHS over the years. The first one is consulting, i.e. pay somebody a lot of money from a company that sounds clever. They come in, borrow your watch, tell you what time it is and head off with a big check as opposed to the people who come in and coach, which means they come in and hold your hand and help you to do the right thing. Yeah, agreed. We should also bear in mind that Epoch was a massive endeavour run by a CTU and, and therefore it's not uncommon across trials in general to see that the smaller enthusiast-led study has a more positive result than the larger massive pragmatic trials. So I think there may be a little bit of that in there as well. 
So Carol, for example, who was involved in the quality improvement of both studies, convincingly discussed why they were clearly quite different in the nature of that quality improvement. And we got a clip about that. You know, it's, now, I've only listened to it briefly, Desiree, but you sat down for a good period of time with Rupert Pierce afterwards and chatted through from this. What did you take from your conversation? Well, <clears throat> one of the things I thought was interesting is Rupert talked about, you know, people were concerned about the complexity of all the, the different pathways and things like that. And that I think what we finally ended up is that it's not the complexity of the pathway, it's the complexity of the process and and making sure, again, like you said, Mike, bringing in the, the teams and building on that and building that community versus, you know, just dropping it in place and saying, here, here you go, have at it. I thought it was interesting to talk about, you know, when they broke it down and looked at the different hospitals, you know, from the larger group, the small group of facilities that were the early adopters that actually saw change and better outcomes and hopefully we'll, that will come out later. It just again speaks to what Romney talked about whenever you're looking at quality improvement that you're going to have early adopters all the way down to the laggards and how do we put these different types of quality improvement projects in place and be able to really make it something for everyone that everyone can implement successfully and most importantly sustainably. Any other reflections Mike because we well, there was some views whereby if you keep driving people's enthusiasms the right thing will ultimately happen. There were other views including some views from certain parts of America where they've had very successful QI programs whereas at the end of the day it comes down to money and yeah. call it what you want incentivization, Resources. bribery, penalties, uh, money ultimately seems to, to shout loudest. One thing that we should bear in mind in all this is that there are several different initiatives that have occurred almost in parallel. So we've got the Emergency Laparotomy Collaborative, which led to the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit, which gives us a national infrastructure for collecting data, which is doing some quality improvement itself. And then layered over that, you've got these two separate studies that we've just discussed. And as a consequence of all that, mortality is clearly going down. It's probably dropped by approaching 2% over the last four years. So something good is going on, whether that's the quality assurance bit, the quality improvement bit, whether it's a contribution from the studies that's driving it, or it's just a general background change, I think is much harder to discern. I think I'm right in saying that in Epoch, they adjusted for the secular change in the background. So, right. so within their analysis is the fact that we know that outcomes are improving for whatever reason within NILA. And I don't think that's the case with the ELC, although the level of difference that they showed is clearly disproportionate with the background change. But I'm not sure it's within the statistical plan. So it's good for the patient, but bad for the trialist sometimes. In other words, if if everyone's shouting about the the problems with a particular, say, hypotension, for example, if you're planning to do large hypotension treatment trials, if everyone's now shouting about hypotension the whole time and that you should treat it, you in a positive way, you contaminate both groups. That's right. But as you say, it's good for the patient. The overall impact of these various studies and collaborations and, and data collection exercises seems to be that mortality is improving in a, in a sustained and progressive way, which is, is great news. But actually understanding why is a lot harder. So, Mike, we should let you go. Thanks very much for giving us your time again. Any other big takeaways from EdPom from your perspective, EdPom London? No, uh, uh, well, I guess except, except that it was striking, particularly day one, where we had the new trials presented and there were so many we barely had time for questions, is that there's a lot going on. There's a lot of really important and relevant information coming through in new studies. And looking forward, I can see, you know, the next two or three years are going to look pretty similar. So it's an exciting time to be involved in perioptic medicine. So we're starting to see these long-term survival curves now with the N being up in the tens of thousands, which I know has been one of your ambitions for a number of years now, that we should be up there where the, where the cardiologists have been for a, quite a while. Absolutely. We've got big studies coming through. We've got PQIP. We've got big data collection in the United Kingdom. There's some really intriguing data coming down the line. And we've seen some US colleagues really step up with the exploitation of electronic health records and the single-centre trials, but doing these in-house cluster trials where they do crossovers like the fluid studies we talked about that's exciting as well very exciting and there's no reason you know given the implementation now in a number of hospitals in the uk there's no reason we couldn't be doing that sort of research as well this side of the atlantic 
Great stuff. Mike, thank you very much for your time. Uh, Desiree, any, any last comments or questions, no, Mike? No, thanks, thanks for uh, kind of going over the Mets thing again, Mike. I think that clears some things up for us. So Great stuff. It's good. I'm, I'm sure Great to talk to you both. I'm, yeah. Mike, I'm confident it won't stay clear. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Sure, we'll just talk about it a couple more minutes. And no, once we get, we get you across again. the pond, I'm sure we'll be back <laughs> discussing this one again. But thanks a lot, Mike. Well done. Congratulations. Excellent. Top Bed Talk. Don't forget, of course, you can meet the Top Red Talk team. All you need to do is go to the website, ebpom.org forward slash meetings. Also, worth mentioning, we're preparing an audience feedback show. And if you want to be part of that, why not get in touch now? Contact at topmedtalk.com. That's contact at topmedtalk.com. We'd love your feedback on any or all of the podcasts that we've sent your way so far. Contact at topmedtalk.com.